And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Erica McKenzie, who during her near-death experience went to heaven, hell, and the in-between. Erica, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Erica, if you don't mind, let's just start on the day that it happened and go from there. Okay. So the day it happened, oh my gosh. Um, I had been taking a class for narcotic diet pill. Uh, it's called fentanamine. And I was doing so to with a goal of losing weight. Um, I had this feeling for many years that I didn't fit in. And I was always doing everything I could, people pleaser, um, to try to change that feeling. And that void just kept growing bigger and bigger, it seems like, no matter what I did. But taking the diet pill took it to a physiologic level that um, this was starting to compromise my body. The pill was designed to be taken under doctor supervision for about four months to a year at the most. And I found a physician that prescribed it to me for nearly nine years. And um, some of the biggest side effects of the medication is you don't eat, you don't sleep. Um, and when you stop doing those things on a regular basis, you know, for years, uh, your neurons start to misfire, your body starts having problems. You see organs and things breaking down, not working like they should. One of the problems that started um, becoming really evident to me the last few months before I had my near-death experience was I had a problem with breathing with my lungs. Um, if I would lay down for too long of a period of time or sit still, it was almost like my brain was forgetting to tell um, my lungs how to open and close to breathe to get air. And I found that like I would have to jump up and down, do something very physical to get my body to remember to get my lungs to open and close and um, started getting really terrifying towards the end. Um, and I got this impending doom just days before that I died that when that would happen to me at some point, I would lose consciousness and I wouldn't wake up again. I would die. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I had this knowing for a long time before I died that day that I was on borrowed time if I didn't make a change. And I kept having these conversations with God that, God, I know this is, I shouldn't be doing this. And it was a secret that I hid from everybody. My husband didn't know, my family didn't know about the pills, but I was addicted to them. And, and I'd never had an addiction problem, but once you um, have a, a problem like that in your life, it's really amazing. It was amazing to me now looking back how it, it completely determined everything I did in my life was for that medication. For some reason, I thought I had to have it, that feeling. I didn't think I could not not take it. But anyway, I kept bargaining with God. I know this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. And, and um, I see what it's doing to my body. But if I'll, I'll stop taking it, you know, um, next week, for example. <clears throat> so I was doing this bargaining thing towards the last, you know, few weeks um, before it happened. And, you know, it just just started tumbling out of control my health. It was so bad that um, to the point that the day that I died, um, I knew I had this sense that I was going to die. And logically, a logical person in the right mind would say, well, you know, tell somebody, you know, tell your husband, tell anybody, call 911, get the help that you need. And um, knowing that I I just didn't make that choice. And looking back now, um, I guess logically I should say that I regret it, but because of what happened to me when I died and I went on to have this near-death experience, I actually am really grateful that what happened to me happened because it actually took me dying to wake up. Um, you know, there were so many things I had wrong, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, I was here on this planet um, until the day that I died and, and the lessons that I learned, um, you know, during this near death experience, which I'll share with you guys, it's just changed every ounce of my being. And I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be here now to, you know, to share the story that I, I did get sent back. Um, 
And so I guess I want to start with when I took my last breath. Um, the last thing I remember saying and witnesses hearing me say was, I believe in God. And at that moment, I took that last breath and I collapsed to the floor. I left my body. And the very next thing I remember is I am on the ceiling and I'm looking down and I'm watching paramedics come running into this room where there was two witnesses there um, staying with me until the paramedics got there to help me. And I remember looking at that shell on the floor, my human uh, body, and knowing that that was me. But, you know, realizing at the same time, for the first time, I could breathe. And this was really me, this, this vastness, I didn't have a um, confinement of a shell. And so when I had left to be able to envelop, um, it was like I had access to so many more senses that I don't even know what these senses would be called, but it was more than, you know, smell, sight, touch, hearing, feeling, those kind of things. These were things, it was like on steroids, I guess, all of those things um, happening at once. And so I'm watching it unfold and the paramedics, um, you know, trying to help my body and having this uh, admiration for those people that were, that cared enough to try to help me. But knowing that I had no desire to go back. I had absolutely no desire to go back into that body. First of all, I didn't even know how I would because it seemed so confined, confining and limiting. Um, and so I just remember having an, a love and appreciation and wishing them well, and then feeling on the right side of me, an angel, but I didn't get to see it. It was such a strong present that it, presence that it was like I couldn't look upon it with my eyes, but feeling it and feeling it pull me into a tunnel. And this tunnel that I was put into was completely light filled tunnel. And we started traveling together at a supersonic speed going up. And the tunnel had a life force that enveloped me and it was love. And I knew what it felt like to have an experience love as human. But again, um, referring to those um, heightens when your senses are on steroids and it was love had a life force of itself and it was all through the tunnel and it seemed to be what was perpetuating us and making us actually move that fast was this love life force, if you will. And this angel stayed with me the whole time and it seemed like you know, and that's the other thing is, as, as I'm talking about my experience, um, talk about the word time. And all I can tell you is that time does not exist when you leave your body or when I left my body um, in the way that we know what time is. Humans have made this thing called time and that's what we all live by, but it's not like that there. So I was traveling in this tunnel for what felt like years, like a very long time to humans. It was exhilarating. It was wonderful. And honestly, if nothing else happened after that, and I just only had the tunnel experience, that was enough because I got the sense that I was home. I was finally home. I recognized and knew this feeling that was encompassing me. Um, how could I know that when Supposedly, you know, I'm just human. I'm here on planet Earth, right? So it was having this knowing of something that you don't remember feeling or being there before. And that I had that feeling of, oh my gosh, I'm going home. So finally, we get to what I see. It looks like the clearing of the end of the tunnel. And it looks like space, you know, the black with all the stars. And growing up in Nebraska, in the middle, you know, in the country, not in the city, I was really lucky because I absolutely love the stars. And because there wasn't all the city lights out in the country, you could see so many stars. And I remember getting to that clearing and just being so excited because it was like that, that love that I had of being able to see all of the stars, but I was there with the stars at that point and not just, you know, observing them from such afar. I was in it. And the life force that it was, it was so profound. At that point, the angel left my right side 
and then God was there. I did not see God physically at that time, but I knew that God was with me. It was this knowing that I had since I was a child. Since I was a child, I was raised in a family of, we went to church um, more than once a week, you know, Wednesdays, a lot of times and Sundays. And so um, God and Jesus were like household family members to me, this relationship that I had. And I had a connection, a very strong connection since I was a child of being able to um, communicate and feel a lot of love with God. And over the years, um, starting at 12 years old, when I was bulimic for 12 years, and then I went on to taking the diet pills, doing those kinds of things to my body, the more things that I did like that and focused on mankind and the ego side of mankind and what was important, it was like I was stifling God's voice and that connection that I had as a child. And so it was incredible because it was almost like I had lost that feeling connection until that moment again, when I'm in the stars and I'm with God and I knew it was God because I remembered that feeling and that knowing since I was a child, when I didn't live in the ego, I didn't know better. And so it was so profound to me because I was home and I felt so much love, so much love, like I cannot even... I don't even have human words to give it the magnitude it deserves, but it was, it was more love than I had ever felt and known. And at that moment that God and I are standing together, I remember looking out at the stars in front of me and noticing that they started doing something kind of strange. They were lining up and they lined up and they made a very, very big curtain, like at a movie theater, a huge movie theater in the old days when they had the curtains and then the curtains would part and then you'd see the movie screen. So I saw this, it looked like a movie theater curtain of stars. And I hear this noise in my left ear and it's the whirring of a, like a vintage um, movie theater projector and that flap is hitting it. And when it's going to start the movie and I hear the whirring and I watch the curtain and it starts to open. And then I see the life review of Erica McKenzie. And the very first thing on the screen was my mom in the hospital and she was holding me. I had just been born. So God and I proceeded to have this life review that was a movie. And I started seeing everything from the day that I was born until the day that I died. And I died at 31 years old. During this life review, the things that I saw, interestingly enough, were things that looking back now, we would probably consider them to be uh, milestones of accomplishment in mankind's eyes. For example, um, losing a tooth in my first tooth in first grade, winning a spelling bee in third grade, um, graduating from eighth grade, uh, becoming a cheerleader, um, getting different kinds of awards for sports and music and theater and all those things, graduating from high school, um, you know, going to college graduating from college, getting married, having children, those kind of things. So there was a theme. And I'm getting closer to um, at the end of this life review. And mind you, again, I want to refer to time because time didn't exist as we knew it. And yet the best way I can describe it is each day that I saw in this first life review was like living it again. So it was like living 31 years again as God and I are watching this unfold together, I have so much love from God as God's showing me all of these things. And I remember getting closer to that 31 years. And then I started panicking because I was raised to believe that we were all sinners. And if you sin, you know, um, there's a good chance you're going to go to hell. And if you don't go to hell, you know, you're definitely going to have to account for, you know, your sins and, and be punished and those kind of things. And so before I died, I was really terrified of dying for that reason, because why? Well, yeah, I was a sinner for sure. For sure. I had messed up so much that it was really stressful to me that I, I was just sure that when I died, you know, God would have that lightning bolt and probably just strike it on me and I deserved it. 
that's what I was raised to, to feel. And so having that mindset, even though all of these things that I had seen up to that point were positive, loving, wonderful things, um, I started to have this human moment of panic, sheer and utter terror that, um, oh my God, we're almost to the end. Oh my gosh, why hasn't God shown me any of these things that I know I've done? I've messed up that are horrible, that are negative. You know, why am I not being punished? Why is he not talking about these things? So I'm having that human feeling. And in that moment, we get to the very end, still didn't see anything negative. And instead, God enveloped and he held me. And he filled me with more love than you can even imagine. So much love. There was one point that I thought I was going to completely burst because I didn't know if I could receive any more of this incredible love. And so to me, that was just huge because like I said, you know, when you live 31 years thinking it's one way and then all of a sudden it's not, that doesn't happen. It was just a huge re revelation. Well. If we were done, I would say that was lessons that, you know, are just enough for a lifetime. But um, what happened next was all of a sudden in front of me appeared a pair of eyeglasses. And at that time, I had never worn glasses. I had perfect vision. And these weren't normal glasses. These eyeglasses were the size of a small vehicle. And they were right in front of me. And the way God and I communicated was telepathically. So if I thought a thought, God was replacing it with the answers. I look at those glasses and my thoughts are, I knew I was supposed to put them on, but it was impossible because they were so big. And as I'm having that feeling, God replaces it with the answer and says, with him, all things are possible. And as soon as he said that, I felt my hands drawing near to the glasses and grabbing them and pulling them close to my face. And by the time I got them to my face and put them on, they fit me perfectly, just like these. And that in and of itself was just profound because I knew that I was not as big as a, as a small vehicle. Even though I didn't have my human shell, I still had this perception of how my true size, five, four, you know, human size. And so that was just so amazing to me. And then God said, now look. And as soon as he said that, I saw the stars lining up again, like a curtain. And I heard that projector noise in my left ear, the whirring again, and I saw the stars part. And then my heart started beating through my chest because I was like, oh my God, now I have God's glasses on now I can see. And I was terrified because I knew that I was not going to see at all what I saw the first time. And here I'm having it, it happen again, right? The stars part, the same picture, the same picture of my mom holding me in the hospital, right? It starts again, except for this time, everything else was different. This time, what I saw were the things that were important to God, not to mankind. And so they were things that there was one common theme and it was love. So the very, I remember the very first memory of it. One was um, I was in kindergarten, I was in brownies and we were at the rest home singing Christmas carols and they couldn't find me. And then they, somebody went into one of the residents um, rooms and I was sitting on this woman's lap in her wheelchair and I was brushing her hair and I was singing, Jesus loves me. And there was so much love exchange that I was giving to this woman who needed love. And to be able to see it and as a spectator almost, but you know it's you, but then to feel it and understand how powerful the love connection is while we are here. And so I proceeded to go through the whole 31 years of my life again and seeing all of the things that I had done and how love impacted, whether it was animals, people, you know, situations, multiple situations, very profound because like I said, every day I lived it like it was a day. So it was like, here's another 31 years that I'm up here, but this is what I'm seeing now with God's glasses on. And by the time we started getting close to the end, 
I started having this impending anxiety of feeling of doom feeling again of the ego human side being, um, I was raised to believe that I would be, have to justify and be punished for my sins. I know I'm a sinner and now I have God's glasses on and he put them on me because also I need to understand how bad I was, you know, is what I'm thinking. This is the human side. And it's got to be coming because I know I sinned. So it's going to be really bad. And I remember having that feeling. And again, getting to that day that I died and not being judged by God. But isn't that what we all do while we're here on earth? Don't people judge everybody? Oh, you don't have enough money. Oh, you look like that. You know, I'm going to judge you for that. Whatever. Oh, your opinion is this. Oh, you're a Democrat. Oh, you're a Republican. Whatever. I don't care. We know judgment. I will use myself. I was guilty of judging. But I learned in that moment with God's glasses on and God told me, none of us are qualified to judge. The only qualification that we have while we are here is to love. And if God didn't judge me, then who do I think I am, this lowly human sinner of a being, to be able to have the power to judge myself or anyone else? We don't. And that in and of itself, that lesson right there, you know, it just spoke volumes to, to me because of the decisions I had made in my life, you know, letting others judge me and, 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 and making, and that made my decisions to do a lot of things when it, I shouldn't have, shouldn't have let that happen, you know? And so there, it was this huge teaching moment. And, um, at the same time was filled with love and appreciation and how much God loved me and how much God loves each of us. And so we get done with that lesson and I'm thinking, you know, I'm done and we're going to go into heaven now or whatever, because I am still trying to go over everything that I've learned in these both two life reviews, how significant and important they really were. And we weren't done yet because God told me, look to your right. So I look to my right, and then that's when the lesson of the rippling effect is what I call it, happened next. This is the only time during this whole experience with God in heaven that I was able to see God in a physical form. And the only part that I could see was I saw from his fingertip, tip of his finger, I don't know if you can see from here, all the way to the arm. So I saw that whole part. And I try to tell people, again, I use vehicles because just to give them an idea of the, of the different size perspectives. From the tip of the finger to the arm, it looked like the size of a semi-truck. That's how big it was to me. And it was right in front of me. And I could feel the life in his arm. And I'm looking at the palm of his hand. And all of a sudden, in the palm of his hand appears a huge single rock. And that rock was the size of a small vehicle, a small car. And I remember just admiring his hand and this rock, and I knew it was important. And as soon as I was fixated on it, this light being able to shine, it can't shine from every orifice of that rock. And it was so blinding that I could barely look upon it. And that light was a love force that was so strong. I knew that that light had the ability to like, it could cut through anything. It, it was laser light strong, like nothing I'd ever seen. And God said, you are the rock. You are the light. The light is of me. And I am with you. And as soon as he said that, he turned his hand and let go of the rock. And I started to watch this rock and it fell. And it fell for what seemed to be, again, quite a long time. And I'm looking out in front of me, watching this rock falling. 
And all of a sudden, a huge body of water, like the biggest ocean you can imagine, you can't see the borders of it. You can't see the land. It's so vast. And there's this water and we're watching the single rock fall. And eventually that rock gets to the water and it plunges with such a force into the water that it makes this huge eruption. And yet only one single ripple formed from it. And that ripple grew and it grew and it grew. And I watched it keep growing until that single ripple, you couldn't see the border of that anymore. And God went on to explain to me, like that ripple affects that whole body of water, so too does man's words, actions, and thoughts affect all of mankind. And I understood in that moment that it wasn't just Erica's the rock, Erica's the light, each and every one of us, if we are alive and here on this planet, are the rock. And we all are the light. The light is of God, our creator. But here's where we get to choose. We get to choose while we're here if we're going to let that light shine or not. We're still going to make that impact and that ripple. We're going to affect everyone with our thoughts, words, and actions. But if you have that love light on while you're doing it, that's when you will do profound, wonderful, incredible things that can change the world in a positive way. If you do not have that light on and you choose not to have that light, you're still going to make that impact and you're still going to affect others and that ripple, but it will be a negative way. And we all think that we're so insignificant. How can one person, you know, you know, why do you try so hard? You're never going to make a difference. You're just one person. You know, you can't change the world. Let me just tell you that that lesson showed me how we can change the world. And it's up to us, if we choose to shine that light, to come together with other people and to empower and embrace each other, our differences, and let our light shine together. And then together, we can change things, really change things. And love is the answer. And it was just... Things that seem like, you know, it, we should all know it. It should all make sense. You know, we should all just be doing this and everything. But I look at my life and, and you know, the things that I did to end up being there and, and having to, to learn something that I think I learned, I knew coming in as a child and I had stifled. And so that was really profound to me. And um, again, I thought, okay, this is unbelievable. I, you know, I'm trying to go back over this and I just want to make sure that I'm retain, retaining as much as I can because I know it's important. And then God said to look to my right again. And that's when we had the lesson of the gifts. And this time when I'm looking out in front of me in, in the galaxy, there was shelves and they were like glowing luminescent white. And they almost took on like they were alive, a life force. And they were, um, if I looked down, the shelves went down as far as I, my eyes could see into the stars. And when I looked all the way up, shelves kept on going until I couldn't see past the stars. When I looked out in front of me in the galaxy and planets, shelves kept on going. And then I turned behind me and the shelves kept on going. So that's how many shelves and how big it was. And then I remember just looking at these shelves and then at the is all at once these presents like gifts at Christmas when you have them under the tree and they're all wrapped filled the shelves there was not one space available left because they had taken up the space on all of these shelves and I'm sitting here looking at all of these gifts and wow. noticing that wow this is crazy like not one is even remotely the same how can you have this many this many and none none are the same not even like a little bit the same, wrapping, nothing. Um, and just feeling like that is just profound in and of itself. How can there be that many? And so God said, when you were born, I gave you gifts. 
He said, I gave you the gift of patience and I gave you the gift of beauty. And this is where I argued with God, which who does that? But it just came out of my mouth. And I remember cutting God off and saying, no, 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 wait a minute, God. Um, you didn't give me the gift of beauty because I wasn't pretty enough. I wasn't, you know, good enough. All those things that I did was because I was trying to fit in. I was trying to get people to like me. I was trying to be enough and it wasn't. And he stopped me and he said, when you were born, I gave you the gift of patience and I gave you the gift of beauty. And in that moment, I realized for the first time what the gift of beauty really meant. It came from within my heart. It came from within my heart. That's where the beauty was. And God told me, when each and every one of you are born, I give you all gifts, each and every one of you. And he said, and do you know what? He said, I actually have more gifts for all of you. And do you know how you get them? And I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea. You know, I'm sitting here looking at all of these gifts on the shelves. And he said, all you have to do is ask. But then you must be quiet and listen to receive them. That was a huge lesson for me. I can't tell you how many times through this whole experience with God that I was told to always make sure that I be quiet and listen. It was really going to be important, not just for me, but I find out, you know, for all of us. Um, and so we went on to have this long lesson about how, you know, each and every one of us is unique. We have our own, we have our own fingerprints, right? I mean, we know that science has taught us that no one has the same fingerprint. That's vital. Our uniqueness is our value. And our value is our contribution here on our earthly journey. And part of us living our lives is learning about the gifts that we have and the gifts that God wants to still give us and how we get those and how we bring these gifts together and use them on our mission while we're here. And then the bigger, most more important part is how do we take our gifts like a piece, like a big puzzle and come together with people like you, other people with their gifts and their uniqueness, not stifling them, embracing and empowering them and their uniqueness and bring them together and work together with these gifts and change things because that's how it works and that's how it's designed. It's never designed for the ego-driven, oh, it's all about me. I'm going to accomplish this and this and this. We're all missing it. To be able to use it to the magnitude of the blueprints that God has designed and unlock it all, it's all about working together. So it was really, it was really profound. And I, it's still hard to put human words to how everything was shown to me, but I can't stress to you enough how I knew it was so important. Um, I was hoping I was staying in heaven, but the other part of me was thinking, gosh, if I, if I have to go back, I have to be able to remember how to convey this to other people because this is the answer. Love is the answer. And, and, and the way that God is explaining all of this is how to tap in to you know, this blueprint and to make all this work and, and just feeling like this responsibility of trying to make sure I remember everything. Um, so the only time I was told to look to my left during this experience was for this last lesson that I had. And that was the earth and flames is what I call it. And God had told me to look to my left. And as I look down to my left and looking out, I see planet earth. And it was the most incredible thing you would ever know. It's like being right there um, on the earth, but seeing it in a way that we as humans, while we're living here, can't see and appreciate it. 
And I am just really relishing the fact of how much I have loved the planet and living on the planet and love living as a human and loved being able to have a family. And I remember thinking about, you know, my husband and my children and my kids were like three and six at the time. So they were little. And I gave up a career when they were little because the most important thing to me, if we could afford to, was I really wanted to stay home and be with my kids. It's just something inside of me that that's what I had always wanted to do was be a mom. And so what kind of a mom would not want to go back to their kids (laughs) if that's the most important thing to you, you know? But I came to understand in that moment that there's a bridge and it is very real. And it does exist between heaven and earth at all times. And so my kids, my family, everybody that I knew and I love on earth, even though they were there and I was in heaven, we were together and I could see it for the first time. Not only could I see it, I felt it. It was all through me. And I had this peace and everything was fine. And so I had no desire to physically go back there at the time because I knew for the first time I was home. Where I was was home and that we were together and someday they would come and be together with me like I was physically left as well. And so I'm having this moment of reflection and this really good feeling. And this is the first time then that I felt sadness, a very profound sadness from God. And as I'm starting to feel the sadness from him, I didn't understand. God, why are you sad? No, everybody's happy. You know, what's wrong? And I remember being told to look again. And I look at the planet and I'm starting to see something moving on it. And some little things are moving all over the whole planet. And as I'm starting to focus on these little things that are moving, these flickerings, I see flames. And as soon as I'm having the realization they're flames, the flames are now engulfing the planet. And now I'm beyond terrified because I just had this whole beautiful experience with my family and I know they're on the planet and now the planet's on fire. And so I'm freaking out and I'm, I'm saying to God, God, help, help. Um, you know, I know they love you and they're in flames. You have to do something. What's, what's happening. And I'm just feeling like I'm going to, pass out and throw up and my heart's beating through my chest and I don't understand. And all of a sudden in front of me, those glasses, the size of a small vehicle appear. And I had no choice and I didn't want to put them on because I knew the last time I put them on, they were God's glasses. And I saw something totally different. I didn't have a choice. As soon as I had the realization they're on, they're in front of me, I felt my hands again, going to reach for the glasses and pulling them on my face. And of course, again, they fit perfectly. And God says, now look. And I didn't have a choice. I had to look. And I was terrified. I look and I could see now very clearly in between the flames was these like um, mercury, the metal, mercury, it's the viscous, um, you know, it's like liquidy, silvery is the best way I can describe it. Looks like that um, consistency and color with luminescence in it, uh, little flickers lifting off of that color in between the flames, unscathed. And I'm looking in even closer so that I can tell what it is. And they're starting to come towards us. The silver stuff is coming towards us. And it's souls, human souls. And they're coming by the droves. They're lifting off from all parts of the earth, unscathed, not hurt from the flames, going past my left and into heaven. And I could feel them. And even though I didn't personally know each one of them, I was connected to them. So it was like I had always known them. And it was a love connection that was allowing me to be able to know them. And they were coming in. And I had this great sense of relief that everybody was saved. And I remember God feeling even more sadness The only way I can describe the magnitude of sadness at this point from God was I have um, a friend who lost a son at 26 years old. He was only 26 years old. And as a mother, I love my children more than anything. And I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine having more sadness than if I lost a child. 
And this is the sadness that I felt from God, but take that times thousands of children that he had lost. And I didn't, it wasn't registering with me because I'm still seeing them all coming in. So I'm thinking it's okay, God. And I say to him, God, like he needs to know, but I'm telling him like a mom, God, it's okay. Look, look, they're, it's okay. They're all safe. They're coming in. They're going into heaven. See right, you know, behind us. And God has me look again. And this time, as I'm looking at the planet in the flames, I see the souls that aren't lifting off. Like they're stuck. They just, they're not lifting off. And God says to me, Erica, hand in hand with the gift of life, I give free will. So I came to understand in that moment that what God was telling me was that he loves each and every one of his creation, his children, so much that free will is the gift of being able to let that human choose that love connection or not. Meaning he's not forcing any of his kids. You will have a love connection with me. You will love me, you know, and everything. That's what free will is the most vital sacrifice of a gift that you could ever give to let them choose. And he was not so happy, you know, you know, oh yes, this, he loves everyone so much that the sadness was because of the ones that chose to not have that connection. His heart hurt for them because he knew he could not force it. Um, and so that was, that was the most profound lesson for me is how much, how important, I mean, we think we're so insignificant, but everything I learned, you know, how important each of us are to God, not just some of us, not just 500 of us, but each and every soul that important. And so after that lesson, it was like, I didn't feel like I could handle anymore. I mean, it was like, I am so ready to just go and turn and join all the souls and, you know, be reunited. I know I'm home. Um, this is what I signed up for. Our, uh, you know, I'm just so ready. And I just remember turning and starting to like run into heaven. And for the first time I was allowed to turn around and see it. And at this time, what I saw was a planet. Heaven was a planet. And that was hard for me because I wasn't raised to ever know it as that. But I, again, I'm just telling you what I experienced. That's what it was. And I'm starting to run in there thinking I'm, you know, I'm going to get to go into heaven and our lessons are done for today. And I remember just being froze and I couldn't move. And this is the point. I'm sorry about my dogs. So this was the first time where I could really feel the sense of humor and appreciation that God has you know, being taught that God is just like, you know, I'm, you know, this, this, and this, and I'm going to judge you and everything. But in this moment, God had laughter. So he was laughing with me because, you know, here I am, I'm like, like a kid get running and he stops me and he says, oh, no, 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 child. You're not staying you have to complete your mission and your mission is down there and I'm looking and it's the planet and it's engulfed in flames. And that's where he's telling me, basically I got to go because I'm not done. And I'm thinking that is not even possible at this point because look, I mean, seriously, what am I going back to? You know? And so I'm having these real human conflicting feelings of emotion. You know, I'm home and how can I be, how can you do this to me, you know, do the, separate me. And he said, remember, I gave you the gift of patience. I gave you the gift of beauty, but now I want to give you two more gifts before I send you back. I'm going to give you the gift of knowledge and the gift of wisdom. And I want you to be quiet and listen to the people that I put into your life. And then when you speak, you will take patience, beauty, knowledge, and wisdom and you will change 
millions of people's lives. And before I could even argue with God, I felt like I was being stuffed into a tunnel and out sent out of heaven and pushed back. And I could feel myself. And this time it was completely opposite of the tunnel that I came up to heaven in. There was no light. There was absolutely no, no light. There was no stars. It was complete darkness. And I felt confined. I felt like I was standing and I couldn't move my arms. I felt confined. I felt alone. I didn't have that love connection feeling like I did in the tunnel going up. I felt like it was very slow. And I felt like at one point I was, it was slowing down and I was terrified because I was alone. I was absolutely terrified. And I remember thinking, okay, I got to get out of this. I'm like stuck. Like I was to a standstill in nothingness. And I didn't know how to get going to go down again, because the sooner I go down, I get to earth and I get to finish my mission and I get to go back to heaven. That's all I could think is I've got to figure this out. What I, I don't know what to do. How do I go get moving again? And as soon as I had that thinking, I heard something and it was in the very far distance and it was like um, a buzzing noise, like a buzzing noise in my left ear. And I thought, okay, well, it's the only sense I have is hearing. So I'm going to focus on that and I'm going to figure something out and I've, I've got to, you know, get out of this place. And so the more I started listening to this buzzing noise, then it became louder and it was like, I don't know if they do it anymore, but when I was growing up in the old days, um, like at midnight or something, when the TV shows were off for the evening, there was like the American flag or whatever. And then they had that, bzz, it was almost like this white noise on the screen, like, bzz. so it went from little buzzing to that, this whole buzzing noise and it was vibrating. And the more I listened to it, the vibrating became more intense and then the vibrate got so strong that it started pulling me out of this confined tunnel. So it pulled me to the left out of the tunnel. And then I was on my back and I was floating on my back. And it was like this noise was pulling me somewhere, but I couldn't see anything. It was pitch dark. And it's pulling me and it's getting louder and it's getting louder. And all of a sudden, I'm just to a stop again. But this time I'm on my back and I'm just hovering in nothingness. And that buzzing noise becomes garbled, muffling, like if a bunch of people were in a, um, a small auditorium and everybody's having a conversation at once. So much so it's so loud that you can't even hear your conversation or anybody else's. It's so loud. It was like muffled noise. And I had this epiphany. Oh my God, this sounds like people. And as soon as I had that knowing that this is people's voices, all of a sudden beneath me, I could see the light. Light came on and I could see all of these people in the darkness and my light was on, my light force, it came on and they could see me. And as they could see me, and I'm just hovering like just above them, I could feel their hands, all these hands, and they were pulling me down, all of them. And every finger that was laid on me, I knew it was human and their, their energy force was taking my life force out. So the more hands that came on me, the, the lower I would get down into this crowd. And I knew at that point that if something didn't happen, that I would not have the energy or the life force that I needed to get out. I could just feel them overcoming me. And everything was completely draining and negative. It was um, south you could feel self-loathing, all of the fingers on me. I could feel all of their feelings. And it was hatred, you know, anger, self-loathing. And the one common thread with all of this was there was no love connection present to our creator. 
So it was all of these souls, these people. And the only reason why they were grabbing onto me is because my life force had came on. I called out to God in that moment. I cried. Please help me, God. I love you. Don't leave me here. And just having that love for God connected me to God again. And I felt reluctantly all of those hands, and it felt like it took forever, but each one of them was taking their hands off me and they couldn't hold me anymore. And I started rising above them again. And I just remember talking to God that whole time and telling God, please, I love you. Don't leave me here. You know, I, I, I don't want to be here. I love you so much, God. I want to be with you, you know, those kind of things. And, and it kept making me finally get out of that space and go back slowly to the tunnel that I was in. And I, and I noticed that when I would even stop to like take a breath for a second I felt myself stop all of a sudden again and I knew that I was going to go right back over into that space and so I just kept talking to God the whole time and eventually I got into the tunnel and I was stood back up like this and I had my hands at my side again and I eventually started going back down towards the planet and it was really exhausting but it just really showed me through that whole thing of how all I needed, all I needed was that love connection with God and everything else would be taken care of. But it was so painstaking to go through it. And I think that it was important because it, 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 if I wouldn't have gone through it like that and felt that, then I wouldn't have understood that that's all that matters is that love connection. And I remember at one point as I'm going back down the tunnel and, you know, earth was still quite some ways in a distance that I asked God, why are they there? Because I, when they touched me, I had all the knowledge come to me and knew they were people like me. And I didn't understand why did you put them there? And God said to me, Erica, with the gift of life, hand in hand, I give free will. I didn't put those people there. They put themselves there when they chose to not have that love connection. God, everything I've learned about you, you would never give up on. Not one of your children. Not one. I saw how you hurt. I saw it when they were in the flames on the planet. And I learned that God never gives up on any of us. And do you know that at any time, those people that put themselves there on what I call the edge of hell, they could get out at any time. God didn't put them there. They did. And they could get out themselves by choosing to have that connection with God. Like I did when I cried out to God, Again, and my light was shining even more, and it was that force that took me away. They could get out at any time as well and choose that. So God wasn't punishing them. They were using their free will power. And that was the result. And that was important for me to learn. Because how I learned heaven and hell and everything else worked, you know, in organized religion as a child, that's not what I was shown. And so that was really important to me to, to experience that. It was a whole awakening for me. And eventually um, I did get back down to earth. And when I got back down to earth, I found myself on the ceiling of the emergency room. And I was looking at this point at my body, my shell, on a gurney in an emergency room. And my husband was sitting there crying over my body. And I just remember having the realization that what was going to happen next was I was going to have to go into my body and having this panic moment of there's no way, there's no way that I can fit into that body. Because remember, our senses aren't limited when we aren't confined to that body. And, and to, to feel like, you, you know, you, 
are so much more than that. And then to see that it was like, it's never going to work. I mean, I really, I was panicking and I was crying out to God, you know, begging God, don't make me do it. Don't make me go. I can't do it, please. I thought I could. I know I have a mission to finish, but you know, I I can't do this, God. I cannot do this. And God said to me, I love you. And with me, all things are possible. And then at that point, I remember just being stuffed back into my body. I didn't have a choice. And I could feel everything filling up my toes, filling up my fingers. Myself was like I was unfolding myself inside of the shell, which was me. And that's when I woke up. So there you go. Erica, thank you for sharing your experience with us. You mentioned that you took a last breath. Was that at one of the times that your brain was not connecting with your lung and you just stopped breathing? Yeah. So the very last breath that I took, um, the people that found me, I ended up being in a a pastor who wasn't supposed to be working at his office in the church that day. And um, one of his church members um, had found me and brought me to the church. It was just like literally a couple blocks away from where I was. And when I was there and they were helping me and the pastor had called the paramedics and he could see, he could see it in my eyes and I didn't have an identification on me or anything. And I remember him saying to me, um, what is your name? I couldn't remember my name. Um, do you have family? Who's your family? Are you married? You know, he was trying to help. I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't remember my husband, Derek. I couldn't, his name, I couldn't remember anything to help because what was coming over me at the same time, he's trying to be helpful and ask me questions is I could feel one of my lungs already like sticking to itself and not opening. And then I could feel the other one was just like slowly, like a balloon that gets all the helium out of it. That's your air, you know, your lung. And I knew that as soon as that happened on that one, I was out. There was no buying more time, bargaining with God, you know. And I remember I had been sitting in the chair and I, it was not me. It was a God force that lifted me out of the chair, lifted me up so that I could try to desperately, I was trying to jump up and down like I had done in the past and almost like restarted things, got my circulation going, you know, breathing again. And this time when I jumped up and I said, I believe in God, that's when I passed out and I left my body. So that was the last breath. Apparently, it sounds like you had a lifetime, or not your entire life, but many years of weight issues because you said you had bulimia and then you Mm -hmm. were taking the pills. Right. Was that issue resolved immediately after your NDE or did it take time to still work through that? Oh, gosh. Definitely took time to work through that. Um. I mean, there was, there's so much that happened, you know, when I came back, it wasn't all, um, you know, wake up and you're this new person that's learned all these lessons and you're just going to be, you know, subhuman from here on out. Um, it just so happens that when I came back and I woke up there in the emergency room, you know, my husband was there and everything. I didn't have a voice, so I couldn't talk. And so I wasn't able to tell them everything that just happened to me. And I wanted desperately to tell somebody what just happened to me because having that experience, I, it was the most important thing to me at that point. I couldn't think about anything else. I didn't want to forget anything. I felt this responsibility, like I said, to, you know, tell somebody else so that they could help me, you know, remember till I could get it all written down. Cause I just felt, like I said, the sense of, of, knowing that um, it wasn't going to be just for me, these lessons to help, they were to help others too. And so that was extremely frustrating that I had no voice. Um, And what happened was, is the doctor, the attending physician said, well, let's check her in for observation, you know, make sure she's okay. And so they checked me in to stay overnight at the hospital. And my husband, you know, went home now that he knew that um, hopefully I was going to be okay and I was in good care. And um, at that point, then, you know, they had given me medications to make, help me sleep. And the next recollection I had was the next morning. And that's when the attending physician came in. It was just myself in the room and the nurse was charting on me in the hall and she had left the door open and the 
the physician had walked in and said, you know, good morning, Mrs. McKenzie, how are you feeling today? You know, you gave us quite a scare. And that was the first point I felt like I was going to throw up. And it came, what came out of me was my voice. And so he was the first person that I got to talk to and bless his heart. I mean, can you imagine walking into the room and there's a stranger and, and the first thing they say is doctor, doctor, oh my gosh, I've just been to heaven. I've been with God. These are the things that happened. First God told me this. And I was just like, there was no time to talk about my health or do a health assessment or anything like that. This is what he got hit with. And so I just remember looking at that doctor and he looked like the thermometer outside that it was like, you know, the color, and then it just drops, like all the color just left his face. And he didn't even do the health assessment on me, didn't even stay to hear what, what I was saying, just turned around and left while I was talking and walked out of the room. And the nurse had heard all of this take place, of course. And I remember her coming in and she was really quiet. And she said to me, she sat on the side of my bed and she said, Shh, be quiet and listen, child. Okay. I know where I've heard that before. She said, but I need to tell you something. I just heard everything that you said to that doctor and I believe you, but I need you to know I've worked for that doctor for seven years. And unfortunately, child, the first person you told coming back from this beautiful experience that you had is an atheist. So right now you cannot talk about this. I can lose my job for telling you. And somebody like the EKG person or whatever came in and she had to stop talking. So it was a couple hours after that, um, that doctor returned with my husband and was convinced because of what I said and because of his personal beliefs and letting those determine my plan of care, which as a physician, you, you know, you learn in medical school as a health professional, which I am a health professional, not to um, let your personal bias influence the healthcare needs of others. And that's exactly what happened. And because of what I said to him, he said, even though you don't have a family history of mental illness, and technically you're too old to have a new onset of bipolar disorder, you clearly have had a psychotic break. And we are going to, with your husband's blessing and permission, check you into the psych ward and get you the real help that you need because you're, you know, you're talking about things that aren't real. And, you know, my husband was just trying to be the good husband, the loving father and help his, the person that he loves, you know, and um, well, that was the physicians and don't doctors have all the answers. Don't they know? Right. And so a lot of people believe that, you know, they don't ask questions. They don't, they just, whatever the doctor says, that must be the right thing. So um, a lot, you know, there was a lot of lessons to be learned by not just myself, but, you know, my family and, and everybody that knew me and how everything ended up unfolding because, um, you know, my husband wanted the best for me. And so he took that doctor's advice and, and I was in Kansas City at the time and my husband wanted the best because if that's really what was wrong with me, he would spare no expense. And he wanted me to get the help I deserve. So they shipped me off to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, to the psych ward where I was there for almost a month away from my kids who were just little and really needed their mom at the time, just for sharing that little piece of what happened to me, trying to share that. So yeah, there was a whole thing of, you know, being on medications that there's a place for medications when you have those diagnoses. But if you don't and you take medications, you know, that you shouldn't, um, look what happened to me with the diet pills, you know, that can cause tremendous amount of problems for people. So it was this whole thing that happened of me learning about not telling the truth about my experience when they would ask me, you know, how are you feeling today? Did you really go to heaven? Did you really spend time with God? And in the beginning, you know, I I told the truth. I'm like, yes, this is what happened. They asked me, well, I learned really quickly. I got on a whole bunch of medications. I was on like eight medicines at one point just for trying to tell the truth of what I experienced. So I learned this learning curve, like that nurse had told me the first day, Shh, be quiet and listen. Remember she told me, she tried to warn me. And I learned how I had to deny my experiences because once I started denying it and they believed me, then they titrated my medications down to lower levels, started taking a lot of the medications away 
And, you know, finally I got to go home, but once I was home, I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew what happened to me was real, as real as you and I having this conversation today. It happened to me and it happened for a reason. And I should not be on the medications that they sent me home on. And so I didn't tell anybody, but I started to, um, I prayed a lot about it and I just asked God to help me, um, you know, get off the medicines. I knew I wasn't supposed to be on them and I took myself off of them. And um, eventually, like, I don't know, it was probably a few weeks later, maybe almost a month, my husband sat me down one day and he said, you know what, I'm so sorry that you had to go through all of this. And, but you know what, you're back. He goes, I see the real you, you are here. He goes, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. And I said, Derek, sit down because there's something I need to tell you. I said, I haven't been taking those medicines for weeks and you're right. I am back. And I need to tell you what happened and I need you to believe me. And I said, I know I hurt a lot of people and I'm really sorry. And so then I, you know, I told them the whole thing about the doctor that was prescribing this, these medicines to people illegally, by the way, uh, that doctor had to go to jail. She lost her license. She actually, a couple people died under her care, taking the diet pills. It was all about money, right? It wasn't about people's health. And, it, and yes, I'm not saying that I shouldn't be accountable. I am totally accountable and nobody had a gun to my head. I was addicted to them. They were highly addictive. And yes, I didn't think I could live you know, without them, I made that choice, but I'm just trying to paint the picture for people to understand, you know, when you're seeing a doctor that moves her practice every so many months. And then the last time that we were all seeing her was in a storage unit. She had rented a little storage unit. And so you would, you know, go in at your time and then she'd pull the thing up and then shut it and pay in cash only. And yeah, and she's dead today. And it's wow. probably because, yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a really long, there's many lessons to be learned out of all of this. So yes, it all started with, you know, 12 years old of being told you're not good enough. You don't fit in. And the choices, unfortunately that I made, but you know, I tell it because in hopes that if I help one person not make those mistakes that I made and to, to know that you're loved. You know, if I could tell people today, each and every one of you are loved just the way you are. Can you imagine that? But to really understand what that means and not to feel like you won't deserve to be loved, you know, if you're not a certain way or whatever. And I just want people to know that everything that I went through, it helps me to understand how true that is. We are just really each loved very much. So. And God wants a love connection with all of us. Since you called the other side home, what do you call where we live now? <laughs> I know. Um, so this is earth school. That's what I call it. I'm not saying she says it's earth school. Everybody has to say it's earth school. I'm saying in my heart, I know it now to be earth school. And I know it now to be that I am here to learn. And again, as long as I am here in this human body, on this planet, breathing, my job is to learn. Now, you also mentioned that you have a mission. Have you discovered what that is? My mission is to love. And I know that sounds so uh, simple, um, but it's really not, especially not in today's society. And you know, love is a lot of things. Um, just being love and not even necessarily saying to somebody, you know, you are loved, those kind of things, but even just uh, embodying what love is, that love force is, and it's, sorry, dogs, if you hear them, um, is in and of itself it's a medicine. It's, it's, if you will, um, it can be a very healing medicine to so many people, the positive force of love. And so it's really to, you know, try to do the best I can to share what happened to me and to help others to know that they are loved and to do what I can to, you know, advocate for other people and animals 
because animals as another lesson, you know, that I learned was um, God has animals on the planet to help us learn what unconditional love is. So especially, you know, the domesticated animals, um, the relationship, they love us unconditionally. And that's there for us to um, learn to emanate that behavior. It helps us. What does that look like? You know, and that's a really good demonstration when we have those companionships with other animals. Um, so, yeah. It's all about love. You saw shelves and shelves of gifts. Do yeah. you recall what some of the other gifts were? That were available to people. Oh gosh. Okay. There are so many. I, I'll give you one example. Um, when we're having the lesson of gifts, um, Shane Martin was shown to me, and Shane Martin was one of my classmates. And um, growing up, I had dyslexia. I had learning disabilities, and he was one of the smartest people I had ever met. And it's like, I, I would remember I would rub Shane's head like in fifth grade and teasing on the playground. Like, I know I'm going to get some of your smarts if I just rub your head hard enough. Right. And he was such an awesome person. Um, his gift was his brilliance, his mind, his intelligence. And um, I remember being shown again how there was one point where I would go to Shane's house a lot of times after school and his mom would make us a snack and we'd watch Flintstones. And then he'd help me with my math homework. Because with dyslexia, you know, um, numbers and letters and stuff, I would constantly flip flop. And he had so much patience and his, he was so, his gift of intelligence, God was just showing me an example of um, a gift that I didn't have, but what a wonderful way to receive the intelligence when Shane shared that with me, with love and care that he had for another human and trying to help. And how it did help me. I mean, I wouldn't, I would have flunked out of math. I would have been in summer school a lot of times if it wasn't for, you know, Shane. And so that was, that was one of the examples of, you know, seeing um, another person's gift that I didn't have and seeing the importance that it held in so many facets and how, again, the reiteration that God said, how it's so important when you each have your gifts to come together, right? And work together. And, and that was, you know, a really neat demonstration of just on a very small level of how that, that happens. Since your NDE, have you noticed that you have any new abilities that you didn't have prior? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah. So prior to my near-death experience, we had spoke a little bit before the show and I had briefly shared that um, my first recollection was in kindergarten, how I had this connection um, with God that um, like I would get downloads. There were times throughout my life that I would get these downloads and um, I would give messages, for example. Um, and I, there's no way I could know those things. Erica McKenzie could not know those things, but I did. And so it was clearly coming from God. And it was this testimony of me learning to step out of the ego at times and not worry about what anybody else would think if I would share that or whatever, but just kind of be a vehicle to let God share whatever it was. So that was all going on for a very long period of time. Well, then after I had the near-death experience, that gift was like being on steroids with that gift um, to where it was happening so much that I had to learn to almost think of the gift as like a, a radio and you take the knob and you turn the, the volume knob all the way down so that I could function like, because you have to function in this human body if you're here. Also, you have responsibilities, you know, things like that. And I had to learn it was that many years of learning this balance of, you know, I call it working for God or whatever, of getting these downloads and things to help others and then knowing when to turn that off. Um, and so that was a big learning curve because it was, like I said, like being on steroids with that gift, the things that I would be told were so accurate and just 
really the learning curve of when to know that, you know, to say something and when to be quiet and listen. Um, And then another thing that happened to me and still happens, these still happen, um, but this one was new. This did not happen to me before I had died. But after I had this experience, I started seeing um, orbs is what I've learned they're called. And so it's spirit of people in a sphere, like an orb, and I can see them with my eyes. Before I died, um, especially when I was younger and growing up in a house that was really old and had a lot of history, um, like with people dying in it and stuff, I could see spirit, like a person standing by my bed at night when I would wake up and I'd scream for mom and dad, you know, and that happened a lot, but I never saw them as orbs. And so um, seeing them as orbs. It, there's been a whole learning curve with that of me learning when somebody comes in that way, um, what it means. The orb is a vehicle and the messages and things. Um, there has to, there's a lot that has to do with math with the orbs and that kind of stuff, which is funny because math was always hard for me. So learning a lot about like a whole um, additional dimension I guess is what you could call it um, here on earth and figuring out what I'm supposed to be doing with that, you know, those kind of things. And I'm always learning. I mean, that's the other thing, you know, yes, all this has happened to me, but at the same time, you know, I'm human, I'm here to learn, like I said. And so I'm really trying to be mindful of taking the opportunity to um, learn as much as I can from others because it's really important. Since you had these abilities as a child, is it possible that you had an NDE as well as a child that you don't remember? Um, I very well, I mean, I'm not going to put that, you know, as not a possibility out there because after everything I've gone through all these years, I've learned that anything is possible, you know, so certainly um, would not discredit that at all. I just think that there's so much that we don't know. And I think that's why it's great, again, to have a show like this where you have all kinds of backgrounds of experiencers share because I think that when this starts happening on a big level, you know, we hear all these stories, um, connections start happening and puzzle pieces start getting put together more. And I think more answers are revealed for all of us is all I can say. So, yeah, I mean, who knows? I definitely probably could have, um, you know, it's just so profound to me though, how the other side really isn't on the other side. They're right here with us, you know, in so many tangible ways for all of us. You mentioned that you could build a bridge or something from the other side. Yeah. And do you feel like from there you could still have a connection with your family on this side? Definitely. I definitely think so. Um, You know, it's funny because uh, I'll just use one of my friends again as an example, Virginia Hummel, who she lost her son tragically at a young age of 26. And almost from the start of when Chris passed, that was her son's name, she talks about how she would get visits like a hummingbird would come, you know, and she knew it was him. There was times and things would happen at a big purple orb and she had never seen orbs ever. It came and sat on her chest and how it was her son. All these different signs that her loved one was giving her to let her know because she was asking, she was desperate as a mother, you know, trying to find some sense in all of this and feel that heartache, you know, and desperate for that connection. When you sit back, when people sit back and they are quiet, they can start seeing in their own ways. It might be through a song that comes on the radio. You know, there's all kinds of different stories you hear about that makes you see that, yeah, you're not crazy. There is a connection. There is a bridge, you know, call it what you will. Um, But to me, it having that near-death experience and seeing it 
tangibly seeing the bridge has helped me to um, just know and have peace in knowing that, you know, I'm not crazy. It's really there. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Sure. I, I mean, questions are important. Like I said, um, the only way we're all going to get answers, you know, and, and learn is by asking questions. So to me, questions have always been important. And I, I ask questions and I'm never going to stop. And I'd love it if, you know, people want to reach out to me. Um, I have a website. That's probably the best way to do that. And it's ericamckenzie.com. And um, they can email me through that if they go through there the first time. And, but I will, I will warn you, the thing is, is um, I love hearing from people and I have for 20 years, but it's really hard to respond to everybody in a timely manner. So I'm going to say right now, I will do my best because everybody is important and I, I don't want them to be deterred, you know, from reaching out because questions are important for sure. You also have a book. What's the title of it? And where can we find it? So my book is called Dying to Fit In. And the best way to get that is to go on Amazon and type in Dying to Fit In. Or I think if you go to books and you type in my name, it might come up that way too. But that's the best way to do it. And my website too has a link um, to Amazon. But otherwise, everybody knows Amazon is pretty easy to remember. So I usually just refer to it like that. In that book, do you only talk about your NDE or do you cover other stuff as well? Oh, no. Um, well, I try. It's funny you say that because I, I definitely talk about other stuff, but I limit it. You know, I just barely briefly touch on um, the messages. I give a few examples of messages, downloads that I've received for people over the years. Um, and I, I briefly talk about the orbs. Um, you know, I talk about briefly a few experiences here and there throughout my life, um, before I died, like when I, uh, God told me that my uncle was going to die and this was back before cell phones. I was little and, you know, orchestrating that whole thing so that, um, my family could see him before he had had a, you know, a heart attack and, you know, those kind of things that kind of just help people kind of see the gifts that I've had and, and how they've grown and how I've used them, those things. But I really, for this intents and purposes of this book, I, I felt led by God to really um, stick to the NDE and the importance and significance of those lessons that I learned. And then, you know, talking about coming back um, after that and the lessons I learned. Are you working on another book or anything else? Uh, I should be, but again, writing is not my gift because of my dyslexia. Um, I much, I would much rather like do things like this, talk about things. Um, I think it flows better. So I, I've been asked, you know, to do podcasts and stuff like that. And I, I think maybe I might consider something like that if I knew that it would help people you know, um, cause I have a lot to share. So it's a consideration. So check back in with me on that. Cause that's something that I've been thinking about now that my kids are, you know, out of the house raised and all that, that I have got a little more time that I think I might be able to, cause I just really do love people and I really want to help, you know, so doing stuff like this, I just, I just, I love having this opportunity. Like I said, I'm so grateful to you and, you know, being able to just reach out to people and, and share. Erica, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Only one? <laughs> well, you've given so many. I'm, I'm, I'm like, hitting oh you up gosh. for one more. Oh, geez. I'll tell you. Um, I guess if there was one, only one short thing that I could tell people is please, 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 don't give up and please know that you are so valuable. You are so loved. God loves you. And there are people on this planet that would love to love you and to help you see that. And 
your uniqueness is your value. So start listening to what I just said, because it is so true. And you are all valuable, each and every one of you. And you're all here for a reason. That's how important you all are. If you're living and breathing, it's going to look different for all of you, but you are all so important. And I want each and every person to know that if that's the last thing that I say, you're all loved. Well, thank you for that message. And thank you again for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me and putting up with my dogs. Thank you, everyone, because I know they have been barking a little bit too much. So (laughs) God bless. Maybe we can do this again. Yeah. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.